Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. Do you guys remember this little fella? This is the simple HF receiver that I designed and built a couple years ago and I've got a multi-part series of episodes showing all the steps that were involved. Now recently I was using it and I noticed a problem so today's episode I'm going to talk about what that problem is and how I fixed it. A couple of years ago, I built this simple receiver for the amateur HF bands based on designs created by Jim Forkin. I made a detailed series of episodes about it that you can find at the link in the description for this video. Now at the conclusion of that series, the receiver was working very well and I was quite happy with its performance. I admit, it sat on the shelf for quite a while afterwards, mostly because I was preoccupied with my other projects. But recently I dusted it off just to use it with my improved HF transmitter and I noticed a serious problem. The audio was badly garbled. It just plain would not receive. Here's an example of what I was hearing with it connected to an antenna. So I did some basic bench tests and it passed them all with flying colors. Here it is correctly receiving a signal being sent by my signal generator. And here it is, correctly receiving and demodulating a single sideband signal when it's loosely coupled to my HF transmitter. These tests prove that there's nothing seriously broken in the receiver, so why can't it receive anything from an antenna? There's also nothing wrong with my antenna. Here it is, connected to my Drake TR3, and it's clearly working just fine. So it's time to take a look at the receiver circuit diagram for more clues as to what might be happening here. The design features a single stage RF preamplifier. That's Q2 right here. There's a switchable bank of narrow bandpass filters after it, but here's a clue, there's no filtering ahead of it. The antenna feeds right into the amp. So whatever RF is on that antenna, the RF preamp is gonna try and amplify it, even if it's already a strong signal. I think it's time to examine what exactly is coming in on my antenna. In particular, I want to see if the AM and FM broadcast bands are really strong. So that would be between 530 to 1700 kilohertz and between 88 to 108 megahertz. The simplest test is to just connect my antenna to a spectrum analyzer. My home built one is not up to the task. It tops out at around 70 megahertz, but my tiny SA has significantly more headroom. So let's have a look with it. Now just to be safe, I put my step attenuator between my antenna and my tiny SA and started out with 40 dB of attenuation and progressively reduced it. And it is immediately obvious that my antenna is picking up really strong RF energy on both the AM and FM bands. In fact, it's several orders of magnitude stronger than what I want to receive, the stuff between 3 and 30 megahertz. I dug up the LT Spice simulation that I did back in the day for the RF preamp. Even though it uses the Humble 2N3904, there's more than enough gain bandwidth here to pass through both the AM and FM broadcast bands with amplification. Based on all this evidence, my working theory for this problem is this. The RF energy on AM and FM is just too much for that simple RF preamp, and it's driving either it or the first mixer into nonlinear behavior, causing what's loosely called front-end overload. The relatively weaker energy in the amateur bands is just lost in the intermodulation mess. A good question to challenge that theory would be, what has changed in the last couple of years since I built this receiver? I mean, after all, it was working fine back then and the broadcast bands were not affecting it. I can think of two plausible answers to that question. The first is my antenna. It has changed since I built this receiver and tested it. Back uh, two years ago, I had a pretty crappy fan-shaped dipole that ran northeast by southeast in my backyard, and I've since replaced it with a much better end-fed halfway that runs northeast by southwest. And immediately, I noticed much stronger signals on the amateur HF band. So it's quite possible I'm also picking up stronger signals on the broadcast bands. The second plausible answer is I live in a large metropolitan area that has lots of AM and FM broadcast stations, and there's no reason to assume that their power and distribution is the same as it was two years ago. In fact, I know there's a station that's about a mile from 
for my house that was causing me so much trouble back when I built the microphone preamp that I had to put an RF filter at the front end to keep its signal out. So maybe it's gotten stronger, maybe another one's gotten stronger, or there's more of them in different areas than there were when I first built this rig. Okay, so how do I prove or disprove this theory that it's one or more broadcast stations that's causing receiver front end overload? Well, obviously, I can't go shut down all those broadcast stations, so the second choice is to design and build a front-end filter that keeps all that energy from ever getting to the RF preamp. Adding a filter ahead of the preamp is definitely not a new idea. Jim mentions the possibility of needing one in his materials and even provided a design for an AM filter. I allowed space for just such a filter in my version, but <laughs> I never built it because I didn't need it back then. Most commercial receivers, including relatively simple ones, do include filtering ahead of the first amplifier or mixer. For example, you can see right here on the schematic for my Halicrafters SX140 that there are band-specific filters between the antenna connection and the RF amplifier. Taking a closer look at Jim's design, it's a constant K band stop filter. There are standard formulas that derive the capacitance and inductive values from a desired center frequency, but since those values are already chosen here, it's more useful to just model it in LT Spice and plot its performance. As you can see, the band stop is really sharp, right around 1200 kHz or roughly in the middle of the AM band. Now in reality, its performance likely won't be this sharp, mostly because the Q values of the inductors will be lower than what were assumed for this simulation, but more importantly, this is not the filter that I need. The best choice for a front-end filter would be one that allows only those frequencies on the chosen band to get through. And that is indeed what's commonly done. Going back to the SX140 schematic, the band select switch does precisely that. However, there are four other switch decks on the band switch that simultaneously select band-specific filters elsewhere in the receiver chain, so that gets pretty complex. And it goes without saying that it's not practical for me to tear up my receiver at this point to put in switchable front-end bandpass filters. So the next best choice would be to install a single, broader filter that allows the entire amateur HF spectrum to get through, but blocks both the AM and FM broadcast bands. Ideally, it would pass anything from 1.8 to 29.7 MHz and reject everything else. The low end is a bit tricky because the AM band ends at 1.7 MHz, leaving only a tiny margin of 100 kHz before the bottom end of the 160 meter band. FM though, that's a no-brainer. There's a parsec of margin on the high end. Because the bandwidth of this filter is quite large as compared to its center frequency, a good approach is to make two filters, a high-pass filter that rejects the AM band and join it to a low-pass filter that rejects the FM band. And here's the design that I came up with. The antenna connects to the left side of the diagram, and then the signal runs first through this high-pass filter, which rejects the AM band. This filter is a design that's been around practically forever. The earliest reference that I could find for it is a 1967 article in QST magazine where Doug DeMau described it. The right side of the circuit is a low-pass filter that rejects the FM band. It's a five-component Butterworth filter, and I chose these values for the caps and inductors from the standard formulas based upon a 3 dB cutoff frequency of 30 MHz. Note that there's a pi resistor network between them. I read online that including this pad helps maintain the impedance match between the stages with a little penalty of some loss in the passband. For now, I chose these resistor values, which minimize that in-band loss to around 1.7 dB. Before I build it up, let's run a simulation. And it looks like I'm on the right track. The 3 dB cutoffs are around 1.5 MHz and 31 MHz. The high end does nibble into the 10 meter band a little bit, but not enough to worry me. Looking at the tails, there's at least 25 dB of rejection below 1 MHz and at least 50 dB of rejection for the FM band. This filter should absolutely kill this problem if my theory is correct. I have space on my receiver board that can accommodate a filter of 16 by 59 millimeters. And luckily I was able to fit the four toroid inductors into that space. The caps and resistors are not a problem because they're all 0805 surface mount. I'll use a short length of coax to connect the antenna jack to the filter to minimize any leakage inside the radio. Jumping over a bunch of steps here, I fabbed and populated my own board. 
I don't have any two nanofarad caps on hand right now, so I just double stack two one nanofarad on top of each other. To be really robust, I should build a shield around this filter, but I think I'll try it first without one and see how it does. I've set up the filter to measure on my Nano, and what I've done here, I've made a little custom fixture to hold the filter. In fact, this is a fixture that I used back when I made the receiver and the uh, HF transmitter just to make it easier to interface uh, with the Nano. One end, of course, connects uh, directly to the SMA connector, but because I've got um, a coax connection that I'm gonna do in the receiver, I just had to temporarily solder this guy in, so it's a little crude. I did cal out as much of this as I could, but it's really not that critical to cal it out because I'm just looking at a uh, you know, broad frequency sweep here. But nonetheless, it did cal out pretty well. And another little trick I like to do here is use the Nano VNA Saver software. That's what's on my laptop right here because that lets you do multiple frequency sweeps and set uh, a very fine resolution in those sweeps and then export the data. And then, of course, I can take that exported data, put it in Excel, and compare it against the simulation. And here are the results, and I've overlaid the two on top of each other. The plot on the right is the spectrum from 0 to 200 megahertz, and the plot on the left just zooms in on the portion from 0 to 2 megahertz around the AM band. We can ignore all that data below 500 kilohertz. That's just noise floor at those low frequencies, and it's not really relevant. Uh, the key thing to notice here is the filter is performing almost exactly as predicted by the simulation, which is great. That means this thing is matching uh, what I thought it would do. Uh, around 90 megahertz, we can start to see the capacitance of the toroid starting to dominate uh, the impedance there. So we, we see a little uptick there, but no big deal. We're still 50 dB or more of attenuation in the filter through the FM band. So I've got exactly what I want here. Next step, of course, is put it in the rig and try it out. Now I did have to solder sockets to the main board first, which then just let the filter drop right in. Like I said earlier, I used a short length of coax to make the connections from the BNC jack on the back panel to the input of the filter. And notice that there's nothing soldered to that GX16 connector by my thumb. I had to remove an item that was occupying this space. More about that at the end of the episode. All right, with the filter installed and the rig all buttoned up, let's give a listen. I've got it on 40 meters, and it's about uh, 11 in the morning on a Saturday. So the band isn't quite as crowded, but I did find a few hams out. Let's give a listen. I get the weak signals and uh, bring out the audio. So, I mean, I still play around. I got an ICOM 7800 that really uh, compares to uh, You can tell how quiet the band is right now, so I'm clearly not getting a lot of you know, overdrive from those AM and FM uh, broadcast signals anymore. That's great. And it's kind of quiet right now. Let me switch over to 20 meters. Two signals. Unfortunately, I had to remove the circuit board that controls the communication between my receiver and my HF transmitter. So I just needed that space for that filter. So this guy had to go. That means no Captain Minion mode functionality between these two right now. Which got me thinking, why not get a slightly larger case? Maybe not one as big as I used here for the transmitter, but certainly big enough that I could put this guy back in and have an integrated speaker. Always a nice feature to have in a receiver, or maybe a few other features. And that's kind of uh, par for the course for home-built projects. They're never truly done. We use them for a while, and then we think of ways to improve them or change them, and that's just all part of the fun. I do hope you enjoyed this uh, simple episode on building a front-end filter for an RF uh, receiver. And as always, I hope you're enjoying the material here on my channel. So until next time, bye for now.